Welcome to our Sound for a Video session. It is the 22nd of September 2016, and we have a number of questions that I wanted to cover today, so let's dive right in. First, from Ryan. Hey, new fan here. I'm a freelance production sound mixer. I love it, but I've still got a lot to learn. I've got a basic question for the Sound Devices 633. I see channel 4 to 6 are not mic level, so if I'm on a shoot and need an extra mic input, how would I go about it? Is it possible? If not, what are the line inputs used for mostly? Well, um, that's a good question, Ryan. I think the the first thing is, is that sometimes the pro level wireless systems, a lot of those receivers have line level outputs. And so really, I think the kind of the idea there is, first of all, you could use those. So if you have uh, maybe electrosonics type receiver, those could go into the line level inputs on the 633. That's one option. Um, another thing I've seen is that if you do need another mic input, um, Moe's Gear is a company, um, I have one of their time code clocks, which is really quite nice. Uh, they also make a miniature, uh, preamplifier, and it's made specifically for the 633 to, uh, essentially give you an additional mic input channel. Whoops. Let's, uh, pull up a, a website here for Moe's Gear. Uh, and these got, I think it's called the Mini Pappy. Actually, it's the two-channel extra gain, I believe. This I saw at the um, saw this at NAB this year earlier, and the idea here is you can you can use this here to be your preamplifier and feed that into the 633 line inputs. So there are some options out there, and from my understanding, that's the main idea: either the kind of electrosonics uh, line level output from the receiver, or other professional grade wireless systems that have line level outputs or something like this or you you know there are lots of other things you could do you could use another sound devices mixer in front of it and feed them into the recorder so lots of different options there oh and if possible touch on wireless hop is your second question where the term come from is it recording a signal to the recorder to the camera or both i don't know why wireless hops are confusing me so much well <laughs> i think wireless hops that sort of can be used in a lot of ways um, I don't know a lot about it because I'm not doing that kind of stuff, to be honest. So I have to make that disclaimer first. My understanding is wireless hops are going to be, um, I think you would use wireless hops when you're getting a signal from set back to video village where maybe where the mix or where the mixer is sitting. So, um, you're going to do a wireless hop between the boom operator and the actual mixer. And, um, Usually they're using pretty high-end stuff like shark fin antennas on the mixing cart and stuff like that. So, again, I, I don't, I'm not an expert, but that's my understanding of what a wireless hop typically refers to. So, Ryan, thanks for your questions there. Next up, several questions from Greg Palmer. Um, Greg had, a, I think, a number of these questions. Not all of them, but some of them are about the Zoom F8. So on the Zoom F8, have you experienced any problems with the file structure name conventions, naming conventions. I've had some problems on an iMac recognizing folders on the Zoom F8, the Zoom F8 produces. I think it has to do with the recorder using some non-standard naming of folders. I have found workarounds, but just wondering if anyone else has seen this. I have not, Greg, seen that issue. I wonder, are there sort of special characters you're using? Or um, I go pretty straightforward as far as um, file and folder naming conventions. I don't use any special characters. I just stick with straight text and numbers. So um, I have not. If you happen to have any more details on kind of which things you're finding seem to trip up the iMac, I'd be interested in hearing that. It's a pretty interesting situation, and I bet you Zoom would be interested in hearing that too. Next question so far is the Zoom F8. Uh, any idea where the F8 limiter is going hit the limit of the ADD, just trying to gauge how much of a concern is the fact that F8 uses a digital limiter instead of an analog limiter. Um, I, I think, I think, well, here's the thing. I, I think essentially the limiter in the Zoom F8 is useful for one thing. F from my practical perspective, it's useful to save you some time in post in evening out the dynamic range of your audio. It doesn't cap. It doesn't prevent any sort of clipping. So you can't think of it in those terms. And I and I assume you you have a good understanding of this already. And so that's not what you're asking. But just in case anyone was <laughs> wondering that, those limiters are not going to help you in terms of preventing clipping. So you have to rely on your gain structure. That is where you set the gain 
for that particular input, that microphone. And you just need to rely on A, setting that appropriately, and B, on the dynamic range of the recorder, which is actually quite good. The Zoom F8 has, um, they in their specs, they cite, I believe, 120 dB of dynamic range, which I may have that wrong, but whatever it is, it's quite a lot. So I don't generally find I have a lot of issues. So I will, if I know I'm working with talent that doesn't have a ton of dynamic range, I may hit, I may set the gain so that the peaks are hitting about minus 12. If I am not sure, I may back that off, mount bit down to maybe minus 18, because then I will have plenty of headroom in almost all circumstances so that if they do modulate suddenly and get really loud, um, I'm not going to have to to worry about that. So um, I don't really, I, I essentially, I think what I'm saying is a limiter. Um, the only thing that's useful for, because again, it's implemented in the digital stage, is really taking audio that has not clipped already and just bringing some of those transient peaks down. So I don't, I wouldn't rely on that for anything in terms of preventing clipping. And if anything, it's only useful for really kind of smoothing out some of that dynamic range and taking care of some of those crazy transients, you know, the really, the transients that stick way out. So I, I hope that kind of answers your question there. Another question here from Greg. In shooting outdoor dialogue, do you have a pre preference for a super cardioid or a shotgun? Do you default to one type or other for indoor shooting? Yes, I do default to either um, a hypercardioid or cardioid indoors. And then I will typically default to a shotgun outdoors. There's no hard and fast rules on that. If you've got really good wind protection, you can take a cardioid or a super cardioid or a hypercardioid non-shotgun microphone outdoors. It's just the wind that you have to be concerned with. Um, so, and, and typically, uh, well, not typically, but in a lot of cases, a shotgun microphone is going to be a little bit more directional. And so... You know, a lot of times that's why people will use those outdoors. Indoors, shotguns are problematic because uh, any reverberation coming off the walls typically goes into the interference tube through the slots and can create some pretty odd phase issues. And the reason that happens indoors is because what you're, what's bouncing off the walls is the same thing that's coming in the front of the mic. So they're just offset by a few milliseconds and you get some strange phasing issues. So I generally do not use a shotgun microphone inside if there's any sort of reverberation in the space. Have you ever used the Senken CS3E shotgun? If so, can you give me your thoughts about its use? I'm considering it, but concerned that the narrower pickup pattern might be difficult to work with. Also, that the higher self noise might be a concern. Um, I have only used it uh, on the show floor at NAB, so like, I don't think that's a fair. I, I don't. I can't speak with authority. Um, it does have one of the tighter pickup patterns of the shotgun mics available out there, and it can be an invaluable tool from that standpoint because you can really really isolate exactly what you're trying to get but you've got to have you've got to be on the top of your game as far as getting that thing aimed is concerned so um i think a lot of it these days my sense is that most people that use those are using them as sort of a specialized tool in certain circumstances where there may be a fair bit of noise in the immediate vicinity of where they're shooting and they want to really isolate their subject in their you know, they've, they've kind of amped themselves up and gotten ready to, to do a hard job of booming and perhaps, um, you know, doing a retake if they if they don't quite get it 100%. So that's that. those are my thoughts. Again, I don't, I'm not an expert on that as well. Do you record with an input limiter, an output limiter? What settings do you run on the limiter? Knee type, threshold, attack, release. Is it always the same settings or do you change the settings for different environments? Well, I, again, I kind of already addressed that on the Zoom F8. I don't generally use it on the Zoom F8 because it doesn't do a whole lot for me. Uh, on the input limiter side, I don't use an output limiter generally. Um, a, an output limiter is your, if you're going to be sending the sound to another sound source, maybe to a camera or um, um, just for sound, for monitoring for people on set, things of that nature. Um, but I don't generally use those. For dialogue, I can tell you that I will sometimes use a soft knee, uh, generally use a soft knee. Just a little bit soft, though, because really all I'm trying to do with a, with a limiter or a compressor is to manage those really extreme transients that stick way out. And um, on my sound devices, 633, um, I believe there is a, I believe that the limiter, let's take a look here. I believe that it has fixed, it has, some of those settings are fixed. You can't change them. 
There we go. Also, by the way, this is pretty cool. Wingman, their new um, little dongle. It's like 45 bucks. You hook up to your sound devices, six series mixer recorder, and then you have an app on your phone or iPad, just like the Zoom F8. Kind of interesting. They're following suit there. Um, let's see here. Let's go to our products. 633. And let's go to our specifications. There's the output limiter. Input limiters. Post fader. The, the ratio is fixed at 20 to 1. And I believe that the attack and release times are fixed at 1 millisecond and 500 milliseconds. Those generally work pretty well for most dialogue. Um, again, what all you're trying to do here is manage those transients that really kind of pop up way above everything else. And so these kind of settings work pretty nicely for that. If you were to use these settings, um, and actually, again, like I said, it looks like they're set. The only thing that's that's adjustable uh, on this, because it is a an analog limiter, is the threshold. Everything else is set. So the limiting ratio is set to 20 to 1. Attack time, one millisecond. Release time, 500 milliseconds. If you were to use these types of settings to, to come way, way down into the audio and maybe drop this to, you can see it it's, goes from, this. they're actually measuring in dBU, which is different than dB full scale. And I'm not gonna go into all that, but if they came, if they brought this way down and we're cutting way into the dialogue with that threshold, it would sound pretty weird. So this, these are the types of settings that you use specifically for a limiter just to handle transients. If you start compressing dialogue and you're doing it to get kind of an effect, um, this, would, this would make a pretty weird squashed effect and not probably something you'd want to use. So the idea here is that when you're using, these are actually pretty extreme settings. 20 to 1 is definitely an extreme setting um, relative to general compressing. And... Uh, these others, I mean, I, I often use something like for normal dialogue compression, I'll use one millisecond and about 150 millisecond release time. And I don't generally get any pumping noises or sounds. So um, this is pretty extreme though. And if you cut that way down, if you'd lower that threshold way down into the body of the dialogue, it'd have a very strange sound, um, not natural at all. So um, these are the settings that I use right here for because I'm using the 633 in most circumstances. When I'm using the Zoom F8, I'm just leaving enough headroom so that I don't have to rely on a limiter to catch those transients. And then I take care of those in post using um, different settings. Of this I don't ever use it this extreme of a limiting ratio or a compression ratio. I almost always do three to one or two to one, depending on what I'm trying to do. Again, even most of the time when I do compression, I'm just trying to manage those, those transients. So good question there, Greg. Uh, let's see here. Given both a lav and a boom coverage on a speaker and post, do you ever blend the lav together with a boom, or is it always one or the other? For me, it's always one or the other. Um, I'm really just using the lavalier microphone as a backup. And uh, in most circumstances, I end up going with a boom microphone and just the lavalier if I have to. So that's uh, that's my personal preference. The reason I don't blend them together is that I don't think blending them together generally gives you anything that makes your sound better. And it usually introduces problems because the lavalier microphone is so much closer to the sound source, the voice, than the boom microphone that you often end up in with phase issues if you do. Now you can correct those. You can offset that. You can kind of nudge the lavalier mic's waveform to the right a little bit so that it's more in phase with the boom. But I don't. It doesn't really add anything, um, in my opinion, generally. So I don't usually do that. Given a dialogue scene with multiple speakers, each speaker is recorded on individual tracks or ISO tracks, as they're called. In post, do you go through the scene adjusting track levels up and down as each person speaks, or do you just leave the levels generally set throughout the scene? Well, um, that depends. Uh, for me, because I'm a one-man band, usually doing my corporate video work. I usually pretty much have to set it and pretty much leave it. I keep the headphones on. If something's way out of whack, I will come and adjust it just a little bit, but I'm not actively mixing through most of the scene or most of the interview or whatever it happens to be. Um, the, the sound mixers that are hired to do large budget films and events will typically do some live mixing. Um, a lot of times if it's just dialogue, just talking, they won't generally have to do a whole lot anyway. So, and really, again, keep in mind that what they're doing when they're doing a mix, they're generally also capturing isolated microphone tracks, 
and adjusting faders doesn't affect those isolated tracks. So the gain is set on those and it pretty much is what it is. When they're used doing the faders, what they're affecting is the mix track. And the mix track is where you take all the microphones and mix them together, and then you are adjusting the levels of the various um, actors or talent. And the purpose of the mix track in those larger budget productions typically is um, generally as just the editing audio. So they'll use that when they're doing the original edit. And then once they pass the production off to sound post, Post will actually bring in the, the isolated tracks in a lot of cases. Um, so that's just kind of a, a rule of thumb. Everyone does it differently. There are different circumstances for every production. And uh, that hopefully that gives you just a little bit of, of kind of insight onto those. So thanks for those questions, Greg. I really appreciate those. Next up from Richard Smith. Has a question for the Q&A. Uh, I have just given a client a first edit of a lecture series I am filming. I have followed your production audio course through and was very pleased with the result. Yay. Great to hear it, Richard. <laughs> Especially as the lecture room was an echo chamber. Yes, those are brutal. My client has come back and asked me to make the sound brighter. So my questions are, what on earth do they mean and how can I do it? <laughs> Not sounding too desperate. No, good. Okay. So no, Richard, those are, those are great, great questions. Let me... Um, just pull something up here. So this is audition, just a clip from a short film that I helped with, um, did the sound mixing for um, a few months ago. And let me just tell you what I mean, what what generally people mean by brighter. Now, I don't know what the client, you know, what their level of understanding is of audio, but generally when people talk about brighter in the audio world, what we're talking about is the high frequencies. So usually if a, if a piece of audio is not very bright, what that means is that there's not a lot of high frequency energy. Um, so what can happen is that the sound, the dialogue in particular, can start to sound really kind of woolly or muffled. Um, and it doesn't have that really kind of, doesn't have that top end sheen to it. It doesn't have the, the high frequency um, crispness to it. So what they mean by bright typically is adding some high-end energy. And with an equalizer, here I'm just using the parametric equalizer in Adobe Audition. Um, you can see here, I'm going to turn off some of these lower frequency things because we don't need those. But you can see here, the vocal enhancer, this is kind of extreme here, but as an example, they're using this um, high frequency node here at 17,458 hertz. Now, granted, it's going to affect some of the audio way down into the, even down into the 3 and 4K range. Um, but it's pulling everything up and they're boosting it pretty extreme. You don't have to go nearly that much, but the idea is to add some of this high end here, just using a parametric equalizer. And you can do it a, br a bunch of different ways. You don't have to follow exactly what they're doing here, but I would probably start with the vocal enhancer. I would turn all these low frequency items off and just work with these up here and just see what happens here as you kind of tweak things. That can add a brighter sound and it does, again, just add a little bit more um, it makes the audio overall, the dialogue overall, sound a little bit more balanced, especially if it is a little bit on the muffled side. So hopefully that makes sense for you. And thanks for that question, Richard. Next up, we have J.H. Brooks. For someone getting started, what would you suggest as a first microphone or starting microphone kit? Planning on a diversity of projects, mainly recording one or two person sit-down interviews, small musical groups, individual musicians, voiceovers, and some natural sound. Thanks so much. Um, and then I just, I asked for a little more information. Currently shooting on Canon DSLRs, 60Ds with a Zoom H4n, but looking to upgrade the camera shortly to either 5D or a C100. Had a Tascam DR60D, I assume that means, with an Audio-Technica AT875R, but the XLR got stuck in the Tascam. That's sad. I've, I've actually heard that a few other times, although I've never had that issue. Um, thanks for all the advice you give on your website and YouTube. You bet. JH, um... I would say if uh, it sounds like you're going to be working primarily indoors and um, and I don't know what your budget is, but uh, in terms of a microphone, one microphone that I look on like on the relatively budget end is the Rode NT5. It's a small diaphragm condenser microphone. It's actually, it was a, I think it's originally made as an overhead, well, what most people use it for is an overhead microphone for drums when you're recording drums. But it actually works quite nicely for interviews. 
Um, in if I'm in a particularly either reverberant indoor room where I'm doing an interview or a room with lots of HVAC noise and I don't have any control over that, the NT5 is actually a good choice. I actually prefer it over my Audio Technica AT4053B, which is a super sorry hypercardioid microphone. In any case, NT5 is definitely worth looking at. So, JH, I would suggest um, I did a piece on my YouTube channel recently about which mics I still use after all the reviews I've done. You you may find that helpful because it goes over a variety of microphones at various price points. And again, you'll find one in there hopefully that will kind of suit your budget. Um, so I, I, that's kind of my first thought, NT5. Now, as far as recorders are concerned, I just posted literally minutes ago a similar type piece where I, I looked at all of the audio recorders I have bought and used over the years and talked about their relative merits and weaknesses. And uh, hopefully that'll be useful for you on the recorder side. So hopefully that helps overall. Thanks for the question. Robert has a question. Hi, Curtis, hope you're well. I have a quick question about recording from Field Recorder, a DR70D and a Zoom H1, and using the output to go into a DSLR. When I set my levels appropriately on the recorder itself, what is the best practice to setting manual audio levels on a DSLR when a signal is coming from the output of an external recorder? I get confused if I meant to set the level on the DSLR to peak about minus 3 dB, or if I should let my field recorder drive all the gain and out only put the littlest amount of gain on my DSLR just to capture the audio coming in and then normalize the audio later, perhaps. Hope you can shed some light. Yes, Robert, I think that's a great question. Um, it depends on your camera. Some, the, the newer cameras, the newer DLS, DSLR and mirrorless cameras seem to be getting quite a lot better in terms of their audio inputs. The original generation of DSLRs were pretty awful. <laughs> so you had to be very, very careful. And that's where you get the advice to turn the input level on the DSLR as far down as you can, just one notch above off, and let the audio, you know, the Tascam or whatever other preamp you're using to do most of the heavy lifting in terms of gaining up the microphone level. So I generally still think that's a good idea if you're going to be feeding it to your camera. What I do is I get the gain set up on my preamplifier or audio recorder first. So there I'm generally looking again for the peaks to hit around minus 12 dB. If I've got someone who has a more dynamic voice, I might drop it down to minus 18 dB, but somewhere in that range. Then what I do is I take I feed that feed the signal out from the preamp or audio recorder into the camera. And generally I will set the input level on the camera to its lowest setting. In the case of the DR70D, you can actually control the output level of the signal going out of the TASCAM into your camera. And you can adjust that there so that the signal coming into the camera is pretty strong. You know, the meter on the camera will show that is pretty strong. So I wouldn't worry so much about hitting a particular target there. Just make sure that you're not overdriving it. And generally, if you have the input level set on the camera down to its lowest setting, it's not going to be an issue. And then I would gain up from there. So we had a power outage. Sorry about that. I'm actually recording this the next day. Um, so yes, you are on the right track as far as feeding the audio from your preamp or recorder to the camera. I think really the only thing to change is, again, keep the setting on the camera as low as possible. One notch above off is usually best. Set your gain with your DR70D or whichever recorder or amplifier you're using, and then set the output level from the DR70D to the camera until the meters are peaking somewhere around two thirds ish. Again, those, those camera meters are really hard to tell. And then after that, you'll normalize in post. So hopefully that helps. Final question. Uh, from Greg, who is looking at uh, purchasing a Zoom F8 or a Zoom F4 potentially when that comes out, and he's looking at sound bags. The Orca is one that he asked about. This is the Orca OR30. Right now it has my sound devices 633 in it. Of course, uh, Zoom F8 will take up even less room in here, but the question was, can you fit a few microphones in here? And the answer is not really. <laughs> this, uh, for reference, is a Zoom, or sorry, a Rode NTG2. So pretty typical size for a short shotgun microphone in its pleather pouch. 
the answer is not really if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> I think your question was, could you fit three or four microphones in there? No, not really, not of that size, if that's what you're working with. If you're working with shorter mics, you could probably fit a couple. Three would be really, really pushing it. Four, probably not. Uh, four, unless you consolidated it somehow. It's not really made for that. Um, what I normally carry in it is a couple of lavalier microphones and time code clocks. And I just carry that until I get to the venue and then take it from there. Again, as I, as I mentioned before, really the strategy with these types of bags is they're made for booming. Um, I can see why you'd want to get one, even if you're not going to be doing a lot of booming, because it's it's really, the nice thing again is that, uh, you can't see this here, I apologize, one second here, but here's the, again, the sound device is 633. It's got a strap system that clamps onto the recorder so it won't fall out and at the same time it's you know all the controls are accessible so it really is made for booming um, but it's nice to have this as just a way to transport because it's really made for holding a recorder like this um, but yeah if you want something that's going to be able to hold three or four microphones, you're probably gonna to need to go bigger. I haven't used the OR32, but I do have the OR34. Let me show you that, that's huge. And in fact, right now, the Zoom F8 Just for reference, <laughs> I hope you can see that. Um, this bag swallows up the Zoom F8, but you could fit three or four microphones in here, definitely. Um, but it's quite a bit bigger. It's not a lot more expensive, interestingly, but it is a lot bigger. So again, if you're not going to be booming, this might be, you know, something in the OR32 or the OR34 uh, range may be better for you in terms of being able to carry more stuff. Again, this is with a caveat. This is not, with discussion right near is not for people who are actually going to be booming. If you're going to be booming, keep it as small as possible. Get a separate bag to help, to carry everything around. So there is our session for this week. I hope those questions were, or those um, that discussion was helpful for you. And thank you all very much for the questions that you've sent in there. I, I love getting them. I think it's a lot of fun to have these kind of discussions. I hope they're, being, they're, hope they're beneficial to you as they are to me. And uh, we'll talk to you again next week. Get out and make some great sound.